Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is How Sunlight's Books Are Chosen. Today, I have with me Sarita Holtzman. Sarita is the, the founder and president of Sunlight, and she is the person who picks the books. So we're going to talk a little bit about all of that. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarita. And thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Yes. So, Sarita, you read over 300 books a year to make sure that you are choosing the best of the best for Sunlight's mm -hmm. curriculum. Talk to me a little bit about how you pick the books and um, any of the guidelines or criteria you might have for those mm -hmm. books. I'd be glad to. Uh, one of the things I try to do is find books that I think will be of high interest to kids. And I want to use a variety of authors because I find that if you find one author that you like, you can read lots and lots of other books by that same author. So it's, it's a strategic goal to try to do a lot of different kinds of books that we do. But I do have seven criteria that I'd like to talk about. Try to pick authors that are from different parts of the world. And it just there's a whole lot of things that go into choosing. Try to pick boys and girls books. There's just a lot of things that I choose. But there's seven things that I'm looking for. So let me go through those. They have to be real, realistic characters. <laughs> there was a period of time in America's literature where, you know, the good guys wore white and the bad guys wore black. And honestly, we've never chosen books like that because people aren't like that. People are nuanced, right? So you can have people that are, you know, good most of the time and then they do something that's actually not very good. So we want people who demonstrate what life really, really looks like. Ultimately, I want my good characters to be heroic in the end, but it's one of those where they have to be real, they have to be real. So uh, we also, number two, we want to build with solid character development. Over the course of the story, we want the character to start off at a point and ultimately end up at a better place where they've grown and they've matured and they've learned or they've uh, grown in some, some kind of a way. We want them to be better at the end of the story. So we want them to have solid character development. Uh, number three is uh, we want the content to uh, add to a reader's cultural literacy. So when we do a story that takes place in the Civil War, we do that deliberately so that they understand what's happening at that period of time. So they understand uh, the different people that were involved. They meet them very regularly and very, in a very easy manner. So the cultural literacy piece of it is very important because we want students to grow in their understanding of the world. Uh, number four, we want it to be an intriguing multidimensional plot. Uh, we want the story to be um, interesting where there's different themes and different uh, actions that take place and they're all woven together. Uh, probably my favorite example of that is uh, When You Reach Me, a recent Newbery Medal uh, winner, where all oh, the different parts of these and you got to the end and you went, wow, that was woven together in a way I would never have guessed. That was amazing. So that's what I'm looking for. I want something where I kind of get to the end and I go, oh, I really like how that all wove together and how that worked. So that's one of the things I'm looking for. Uh, number five has to be emotionally compelling. Uh, I want a story that's going to move the hearts of kids because we found that when you can actually grip the hearts and emotions of kids, uh, they remember things better, right? If you read something that's an uh, adult textbook, for example, you might go, well, oh, it goes in one ear and goes out the other. But if you like the characters and you like the story and it grips you and uh, it has an impact in your life, that, that's the type of thing I'm looking for because it's memorable and it's significant in the lives of the kids. So it's, it has to be emotionally compelling. Uh, number six, it has to be verbally beautiful. Uh, there's some stories that just flow, where the words are just elegant and they're just, uh, it, it's just one of those things where you kind of get done and you go, wow, I really like how that author writes. So it has to be verbally beautiful. So that's one of the things I'm looking for when I'm reading it. And number seven, it has to be rereadable. Uh, there were a number of years when I read all of C.S. Lewis books uh, every year. I read them annually for a very long period of time. And to me, that is the epitome of a well-written book. You want to be able to have one that you say, I want to read this again. And occasionally, actually, I'll put a title in sunlight. And when I come back and I have to read it again, I'll go, oh, and I actually want to do that. It gets pulled because it has to be something we want to reread again and again. So uh, those are the seven things that I'm looking for in a story. And I think... Um, it's a, it's a way to say, let's look for the best of the best. And I feel like these are a way for us to find those. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great guidelines. So there are so many benefits to reading. 
can yeah. you maybe highlight some of your, or I'm sorry, reading great literature. Let's, let's make sure benefits of reading, but also benefits of reading great literature. Sure. Can you talk about some of your favorite benefits or some of the ones that stick out in your head a little bit? I'll be glad to. I actually made a list because it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of them. And I thought, oh, which ones do I pick? Because there's a lot. But uh, for one, it makes history come alive. I think a lot of times when we read, again, go back to a textbook and you read about well, the Revolutionary War and you think, oh, well, it happened way, way back in the past. Whereas if you read a story that takes place at that time period, you recognize that real people were impacted. Real people had uh, difficulties that arose as a result of this. Real people lived through this, and it makes it much more uh, interesting and, again, memorable. It makes it part of your life and part of your soul and your spirit. It's, it's a way to uh, make history absolutely come alive. Uh, it, I think to you know, read a story that takes place in the Great Depression and the girl's in the washroom and she's scrubbing the clothes and you just, you just get a sense of what life was like at that time in a way that you can't capture in any other form. Uh, I think, too, we can spend less time memorizing dates. Uh, if you read historical fiction in a consecutive form, you get to the point where you go, okay, so that was back then, this is now, and you can triangulate back to when it actually probably happened. <laughs> uh, we have a story that one of our moms wrote to us about her son that he was uh, taking a test, and it was a multi, you know, a multiple answer choice, multiple choice question. And he had three different selections he could make. And he went, okay, it was before this and it was after this, therefore it was this. And I believe that's the best way to learn. Rather than memorizing dates, to be able to reason it out and to think it through. Perfect, um, perfect way of learning and a great way to do this in a way that's painless, enjoyable, and becomes, again, part of who we are. So that's another example of what we can do. Uh, we get to travel. We get to travel around the world for pennies on the dollar. You know, you think about the cost of a book and you can go, go to the pieces of the world. You can travel to India. You can travel to the Middle East without uh, the 24-hour flight, without uh, worrying about uh, germs from the food that's in the country there. But you can actually experience life in other countries as you meet up with characters that maybe eat different food than you do and go to a different type of a school, maybe pray in a different way. But you get a chance to understand the world in a way that's absolutely approachable and doable, and it's something that we can do very, very effectively. I think, too, you can learn random facts effectively. <laughs> uh, when I was a child, I read a lot of the Trixie Belden, they were a detective type of a story, but I learned back then that uh, snake bites can be handled in a particular way, and I'm here to tell you that I've never forgotten that, and if I'd read it in a uh, textbook, I'd never remembered it, right? So, so uh, those types of things, I learned about latitude and longitude when I read uh, Kirjan Mstravovich. We learn things as we read, and that's the goal, because the, the reading is painless, and it comes in a very effective and easy, easy way. Now, you can broaden your children's vocabulary painlessly, and this is important, because the standardized test that students take, the SAT, vocabulary is a huge, huge piece of that. And kids that read broadly actually pick up vocabulary in ways that are just almost magical. Uh, I can remember uh, we were reading in uh, one of the Dickens' books and talked about that there were pecuniary um, things that happened in the story. And my son, who was 11, 11 or 13 at the time, said, oh, he, he, he started using that word. And I thought, what, what child that age actually uses that? But it's just an example. <laughs> I can remember my daughter was um, talking to her swim coach. And he looked at me, started laughing, and I went to him after us. She didn't say anything, but he said, oh, could you believe how advanced her vocabulary was? And I thought, I did not teach her one vocabulary word. It was totally because of the things we had read together. So it's a way to, um, I, it's a way to learn vocabulary without having to memorize anything or go to lists, which don't work anyway. So it's a terrific way to get one of those things that we actually need to have. I think, too, uh, we can encourage those listening skills that are so important. We want to be able to hear our spouses, hear our bosses, hear our friends. And as we read aloud, particularly to our kids, they learn to listen. They learn, learn to uh, wait to hear what's coming next. They learn to focus and to, uh, it's, it's a super important life skill. And we can do that just by reading stories to our kids. It's a super, super easy way to do that. Uh, we can enhance the writing skills of our kids. Our children learn how good stories sound. 
Uh, they learn that stories have a beginning and a middle and an end. They learn that you mix up your sentences almost by curious. It's almost, uh, they pick it up almost as they're just listening to how the cadence and the flow and uh, all those kinds of things that maybe when they first start writing, they can't emulate in a way they'd like to, but they know it in their inner soul what it should look like and what they should be doing. So that's, that's an example of another thing. That, I mean, we think about Ben Franklin, he's always the example. He would uh, totally teach himself to write by, he would actually read something first and he'd close the book and then he'd say, let me see if I can write it either that way. And he got to the part where he actually liked his own writing better uh, than what he had found in the book that was there. So he just had learned, taught himself how to read just in that very natural, very easy, very organic way of doing things. I think a key one that we don't often think about is we want our kids to gain cultural literacy. Uh, it's something that when, all, when people write, they assume we have a certain foundation and a certain framework that they're building on. So they write assuming that we know that the Civil War happened, for example, or they know uh, we've read some of the Greek myths. So they'll talk about an Achilles heel. heel. So an Achilles heel, of course, comes from one of the Greek stories. And if we haven't read, or a siren song, or a Cinderella story, all those terms are used, and our students might not know what they mean if they haven't read broadly. So by reading broadly, we can give our kids that very useful skill, that useful ability to understand uh, the things that are written, the things that come up in the world as they walk through them. Critical life skills, critical thinking skills, super, super important, cultural literacy, sorry, cultural literacy is a super important skill for our kids to achieve, and we can help them gain that basically by having them read great books broadly. I think too we want to train our kids in their, in their critical thinking skills. Uh, as the world comes up with more and more things that we need to evaluate and we need to understand, we can help our students gain critical thinking skills by having them read broadly. Uh, when we use a textbook, for example, you get one author or possibly a group of authors' opinion. And our kids can get to the point where they think, oh, that must be what's actually true. Whereas if we read from a broad variety of different things that are out there, you read the stories of a slave girl, you read you know, something that happened through uh, the Civil War, the family gets together and they talk about the different sides and they almost argue about it over the table. You get to see them, you get to a chance to triangulate what the truth is and what we actually should believe. Critical thinking is something that we gain as we read broadly, as we look at different positions, that we look at different sides, as we evaluate things from different perspectives. One of those things we can train our kids in, and it's a super important life skill, and it's something that we actually want to give our children the gift of, the gift of critical thinking. Uh, we want to give uh, kids a chance to read favorite books, the books that they'll read again and again. How many of us have favorite stories that we've done throughout our lives and we're just they're, they're getting ragged they're getting uh, the pages are turned and twisted but don't we want our kids to have favorite books that they'll come to again and again so introduce our kids to a variety and may it be that they uh, love stories and get to a point where they're just so grateful for the chance to read and finally i think we want to create a love of learning uh, when you read stories that grip your heart that give you an understanding of the world where you actually love what you're studying and what you're learning, but that's a great gift we can give our kids. So to give our kids a love of learning in a way that they won't get through computer things, they won't get through textbooks, they will get it through books. So can we raise up kids that love to read, that love to learn? Because when they love to read, they have no barriers, they have no blockages, they can do whatever God called them to do. So may it be that we love to love to read and we love to get into books and uh, just to experience this marvelous, marvelous way of learning. And may it be that our kids rise up and say, boy, I never knew. I love to read. Thanks, Mom. May it be so. Oh, thank you so much, Sarita. That's so inspirational and also very helpful on how mm -hmm. the benefits of reading and how Sunlight Books are chosen. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate it, Stephanie. Bye-bye.